Today, we are talking about what you need to know about the risks and the benefits of genetic counseling for cancer survivors. If you were never tested at the time of your diagnosis years ago, is there value in testing you now? If you were tested years ago, whether positive or negative, should you be retested? And if so, when? How can information you learn about yourself help your family? And what are the protections and the limitations of the federal law called GINA, or the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act? And if you do test, positive or negative, how does that impact you, your family, and your cancer screening recommendations? Welcome, and thank you for being here. I'm cancer physical therapist, Dr. Leslie Waltke. We will answer all of these questions for you and more in this episode of the Recovery Room Podcast. This is the Recovery Room Podcast, discussing all things cancer and cancer recovery. We bring you the experts' accuracy, understanding, and next steps you need to be healthier, more confident, make better decisions, and live your best life after cancer. I am excited to introduce you to Deborah Wham, who's a certified genetic counselor. You're just a brilliant, brilliant brain there, Deb. So I'm glad to have you on the show. Thanks for being here. Well, thank you very much. That was a fabulous introduction. Yes. Deb is getting over sinus and cold and laryngitis. And <laughs> so I appreciate you yes. sticking it out with us here. All right. So let's start with a couple of information bullet points. So true or false? Anyone can inherit any gene mutation from both their mother or their father, including the breast cancer gene mutation. Correct. That is true. So it does not matter the gender. Either person can pass it on. Correct. Yeah. All right. Do gene mutations skip a generation? They do not. They cannot. They just, it's not biologically possible, correct? Exactly. Yes, correct. You've got to get it from your parent in your body to give it along to somebody else. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So I think does the confusion there come? So um, maybe my father gave me the, the breast cancer gene mutation. Um, I don't get breast cancer in my lifetime, but I have a biological daughter I give it to and that she could get breast cancer. Yeah, that's exactly right. And, and we see that almost more when your grandmother had breast cancer and it turns out she had a gene that causes breast cancer. And then um, your father inherited it from her and he's way less likely to get breast cancer. Right. So it looks like it skips, but then, you know, the daughter of that man gets breast cancer. So it doesn't skip. The disease may skip a generation depending right. on what the risks are, right. but the actual gene itself has to be passed down parent to child, parent to right. child. Right. Also, here's an interesting question I thought of a while back is, does that gene mutation ever fade away or will, you know, 50 generations down the line will still be there? You know, it, it doesn't fade away without some sort of medical fertility type of intervention. Okay. It's always going to be a 50% chance that the next generation inherits it from somebody who has it. Um, and, and of course there are, because it's a 50% chance and it's like tossing a coin, there are families that I've even seen where you have, you know, sisters that have this gene mutation and each of them have two children or three children and none of them inherited it. And so mm -hmm. naturally, yes, that, that completely stopped it in its tracks, right. but otherwise it's always a 50% chance. Okay. So it's just a, it would be just luck of the coin flip that you get a bunch of people that didn't get the, they didn't right. inherit it, so therefore they can't pass it on. Therefore, hopefully it kind of weeds itself out of the family tree. Exactly. Gotcha. Okay. All right. And then I, I like this statement too, that, Everybody has a BRCA1 and BRCA2 gene. Everybody's got the gene. It's the gene mutation that causes the issue. Exactly. Those genes in general, their job is to try to protect our bodies from cancer. They do a lot of repair work in the body. And so they have to function normally in order to do that. If one of them has a mutation in it where its code you know, is no longer correct, there's pieces missing, there's extra pieces some of these code pieces are rearranged. So it, it, we can't read it the same way anymore. Then that's a mutation. And that means that it's not functioning anymore. So it's not protecting us. Okay. All right. So you don't get that little protection piece. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. All right. I know that um, there are laws in place that protect information. And if somebody does test positive for a gene mutation. They protect you against discrimination, um, employee discrimination, health care, health insurance discrimination, Medicare housing 
but there are limits to those laws. What, what are they? Yeah, a couple limits. So the federal law is um, GINA or the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. Okay. So if a state doesn't have similar laws, then GINA is basically the umbrella law. And ultimately, GINA's purposes uh, were, are, are two things, which is employment um, and health insurance. Okay. So what that means is that if you have a gene mutation that increases your risk for cancer, for example, it's not just about cancer, but in this example, mm -hmm. um, then, but you don't have the disease, so you don't have cancer, that's who it really protects. So I know that I have this very high risk for cancer, but I don't have it. I, my, my employer can't fire me or even not hire me. My premiums for my insurance cannot be raised. Um, or, or so things like that protect mm -hmm. you. Once you have the disease, that law doesn't really apply so much anymore. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Because now you've already had the disease. And so that then starts to speak to pre existing conditions, which we are still pretty well protected by both HIPAA and some of the Affordable Care Act. So for the most part, where Gina left off, those laws have picked up. So long as those stay in place, uh, we're not as concerned. Now, the other part of the limitation is that Gina itself doesn't apply to federal employees and it applies to businesses of certain sizes. So the vast majority of Americans are covered, but it doesn't cover absolutely everybody. What, are there other some some other misconceptions out there that we didn't hit in our in our rapid bullet points that you want to talk about? Sure, I, you know when it comes to hereditary cancer and genetic testing, I do think that the big one is that because it's because it's a breast cancer gene, you know you can't inherit that from your dad's family or that kind of thing. But I think the other part of it that goes along with that is that when we're talking about a gene that does increase the risk for breast cancer, that we don't need to be concerned about testing men for that gene because right. they are men and they're less likely to get breast cancer. But even the BRCA genes that you mentioned earlier have increased risks for other cancers. Um, pancreatic cancer is one of them. And for men, the uh, risk for prostate cancer is somewhat increased. It's not you know, as high as breast cancer, but what we've figured out is that the BRCA genes, really the, the prostate cancer that we see associated with them is a more aggressive prostate cancer than in the average man. So what are the, what are the current guidelines now for screening and testing for the average person on the planet? You and I both know they change quite frequently as, as they are updated. But for somebody who's at average risk for breast cancer, a woman at average risk for breast cancer, the, the screening guidelines, they vary depending on who has put those guidelines out. But, you know, in general, what we follow is screening mammogram getting at age 40. Mm -hmm. The difference is if we know somebody has a BRCA mutation or maybe even a different gene mutation that increases the risk for breast cancer, it is likely that we're going to start screening them earlier. Okay. Yeah. And so for those women, you know, uh, especially for BRCA mutations, we tend to start with breast MRI mm -hmm. and we tend to start around age 25 and add the mammogram later because younger women have more dense breast tissue. And so it's much more difficult for a mammogram to actually really see through that tissue and to be able to identify any abnormalities. You know, another one is, uh, in fact, a good example is colon cancer because more recently the, the general population guideline has been changed so that folks 45 years and older should start screening mammograms. It used to be age 50. I mean, uh, colonoscopies. Uh, yes, thank you. <laughs> colonoscopies. A mammogram would not help your colon. Right, it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> screening colonoscopy. Yeah. Um, and it's a very different test. Yes, it is. Um, so, you know, so that, that already changed. But again, if if there's someone with a hereditary colon cancer, and the most common one is what we call Lynch syndrome, for those folks, we start colonoscopies. We start screening with colonoscopies around age 25 again. Mm -hmm. And for those folks, just because of the sheer really speed at which they develop polyps, um, we tend to screen them every one to two years with colonoscopy. So the, the screening guidelines for the general population and what we do for folks with hereditary cancer tend to be very different. Okay. All right. So let's now kind of switch to 
um, looking at genetics from, from the standpoint of somebody who's already had cancer. Okay. Um, and, and you and I have talked about, yeah, kind of the twofold approach to this. Number one is you need to know your own family history. And the, the big follow-up that I like that you push is it doesn't do you any good to know your family history. If your if your primary physician doesn't know your family history. Right. And then the second part is how, how can you help protect your family with the information that you have yourself? Right. So. Yeah. The family history is very important because it's the, it, it's the foot in the door. We mm -hmm. haven't gotten to the place yet where we say everybody who's been diagnosed with cancer should have genetic testing to see if it's hereditary. Mm -hmm. We haven't done that. I think we're going to get there, but I'm not real sure that that's going to happen, you know, within the next even five to 10 years. Okay. So the family history is of cancer is what tells us whether someone is a good candidate or qualifies for genetic testing. Gotcha. Okay. Sorry to interrupt you. So is it still about five to 10% of, of cancers that are diagnosed are found to be related to a gene mutation? So it's still a really small piece of the overall cancer puzzle. Is that, is it still around that number? Yeah, that's the number that we still think is true. Okay. I do think that we're going to probably have to update that as we have added, you know, more mm -hmm. and more genes mm -hmm. to the list that we test. Cause we kind of came up with that number back when we really only looked at the BRCA genes. Right. So if somebody was tested years ago around the time of their diagnosis and they got this information, even if they were, didn't test positive for any gene mutations, I know you guys are now recommending to retest because there's so much more stuff that they can look at in your gene profile. So tell me, tell me about that. When should people go back? Yeah, when I see patients, if they test, especially if they test negative, I usually tell them to revisit that in about five years. Oh. If they remember me in about five years, they're welcome to contact me or any of the other genetic counselors, but more likely they're going to go back to their physician and ask, are there any updates? Should I consider testing again? And um, their physicians may or may not know the answer. And so typically then I get those inquiries from the physicians also. And it's just that the guidelines change the genes, we've added so many more genes. So every five years is a very loose rule of thumb. Okay. And then, so at this point in time, is it fair to say that cancer survivors should kind of put it on their calendar because they're maybe the ones that need to follow up on that? I definitely think that's a good idea because, and I'll give you exa an example, 10 years ago is, is probably when we said, you know, we really should test every woman who's had a triple negative breast cancer under the age of 60 mm -hmm. to see if they have a gene mutation. They don't need any family history. That's all we need to know about them. They're under 60 and uh, they're tr they have triple negative breast cancer. Well, within the last few years, that's expanded. And now it's just all women with triple negative breast cancer. Mm -hmm. So, you know, depending on when you were diagnosed, you might not have qualified, but you might qualify now, even though the pool of genes might not have changed in that right. time. So if you have, if you were tested more than five years ago, regardless of your cancer status, you should ask to be retested again. Yeah. Or ask if you qualify. Okay. Okay. And you can bring that up to your oncologist. You can, you can bring that up to your genetic counselor. You can bring that up to your primary care physician. Yes. Okay. And then, so obviously people want to protect themselves, but as cancer survivors, they have all these genomic tests like Oncotype DX and all these genetic things are coming down the pike. But right now, that information just helps people pick better treatments for their current cancer. But there is there is no genetic counseling or genetic testing for changing the chance of recurrence or, or stopping recurrence, correct? Right, correct. Okay. The, the genetic testing, specifically when you're looking at hereditary cancer, those genes can play a role in your treatment for your cancer because there are some chemotherapies, for example, that are very specific and that target that error, that gene mutation. Mm -hmm. um, so it can play a role in your treatment. But as far as that type of genetic testing, it really doesn't tell us anything about the chance of a recurrence of the same cancer that someone already has. It can tell us about a new primary in many cases, um, like a new diagnosis of breast, a brand new breast cancer or a different kind of cancer. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Okay. So if somebody was t tested in the past, tested negative or positive, and it's been five or 10 years, they should inquire um, about the value or the qualifications for being retested again. Exactly. 
Okay. And if somebody wasn't tested in the past because they didn't qualify or nobody brought it up to them and they went, went through cancer treatment and now is a cancer survivor, they should also inquire about. Definitely. Yeah. Because again, that gives you the advantage of knowing, okay, what are my potential uh, vulnerabilities for getting a new cancer? Okay. Yeah. And then how do I, do I screen differently? Do, can I do any kind of prophylactic surgeries? But the second thing I want you to talk about is, but I mean, that information is going to help us, but also it's going to protect family. Exactly. I think those are the two things that are uh, the most important to someone who's already had a cancer. Mm -hmm. The first is it's important to realize that unfortunately, if it is hereditary, it does usually mean that you're at increased risk for another type of cancer also, maybe more than one. So we can't just say, look, I had breast cancer. I don't need to think about this anymore because unfortunately that's not the case. But the other part of it is, uh, you know, we do test some folks that might have widely metastatic disease. It's not going to change anything about their medical management, Mm -hmm. but we are testing them because that information can, has, has wide reaching implications into their families, potentially. Even if they don't have children, we're potentially talking about their own brothers or sisters, nieces or nephews, even cousins. Mm -hmm. How do you guys deal or approach somebody that says, so maybe a family member's in with somebody that says, Oh, do you want to get tested? I I just, I wouldn't want to know. I don't want to know. Yeah. Uh, How is there, you know, obviously you can't push people into medical decisions, but what are, what is your language or how do you approach a situation like that? Yeah. So first that is true. And I usually say to people, absolutely. That is, absolutely somebody's right not to know. My thought is that the type of testing we're doing can really produce quite a bit of anxiety. Mm-hmm. So it does, it does somebody no good to have this test, find out they have a gene mutation and it causes so much anxiety that they're paralyzed. Right. That did them no good. Right. And if that's going to be the case, then I agree. I agree. It might not be right for that person to not test, but typically what that person is saying and where their brain is going is, I just don't want to know because I don't want to know if I'm going to die from cancer. You know, like we're going, we're going to the extreme rather than the middle pieces of if we find this out, we can screen for it. We might even be able to prevent it or find it very early. Mm -hmm. And so I, I typically also say, you know, here's the purpose. And, and if, and if you're still feeling like I just can't handle that information, then that's perfectly fine. But otherwise, I just make sure that that person understands what the utility of the information really is. Right. Depending on what type of cancer we're concerned about, breast cancer is the great example because you could choose screening or you could choose preventive surgeries. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, we know that removing the breasts um, if, as a risk reducing surgery uh, cuts the risk by 90%. It's just the biggest risk reduction we yeah. have. Um, and that's wonderful. Some folks, though, that's not the option they want, and they go into screening. And that's still effective because we know that we are far more likely to find a cancer earlier, which requires less intervention, less treatments, than if we weren't looking for it. Yeah. So that's that's the great example of you know being able to say, here are your options. You could choose one or the other. Mm-hmm. There are other cancers, however. Ovarian cancer is a good example where we don't have those options. Right. We don't have screening where we can find ovarian cancer in an early enough stage to cure it. Mm-hmm. You know, we're a lot better at treating it and prolonging somebody's life, but we're still not detecting that until you're stage three disease. Mm-hmm. Um, so when we know somebody has an increased risk for ovarian cancer, the recommendation is pretty much always around age 40 to have the ovaries removed and the fallopian tubes Mm -hmm. because we can't screen for it. Our only option is prevention at that point. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, Right. Because different cancers have different abilities to catch it early with the screening that we have. So like mammograms are pretty good. Colonoscopies are pretty gosh darn good. But again, for pancreatic cancers, uh, ovarian cancers, it's just lung cancers are a little bit better, but those are, yeah, we just can't with high degree of accuracy, catch those really early yet. Exactly. Um, And I just want to point out something I think that you said was really, really important is that most of the gene mutations, even though we call it the breast cancer gene mutation, can lead to the development of other cancers. So even though you've had breast cancer already, I've had a bilateral mastectomy already, 
And then just, so I don't need to worry about it. Well, yeah, your risk for ovarian cancer is very high. Or your risk for pancreatic cancer is higher. Or if you're a gentleman, your risk for, for um, prostate cancer is higher. So I think it's really important for people to understand that a gene mutation is usually linked to more than one cancer, correct? Yes. And I would say that's the one thing that people in the general public just wouldn't know that. Right. So I think that that also becomes a really important part of decision making as to whether or not you want a genetic test. If it really was about one cancer only, there, there really might not be a need for that. Right. But unfortunately, that's just not the case with the vast majority of the genes that we test for. Yeah. In a family that is known to have you know, gene mutations, what, what ages are they recommending now to, I mean, do you bring this up to your 10 year old, your 12 year old, your 18 year old, your 20 year old? I mean, when, when is that, when does that discussion happen? And when do people get to, to the right to choose themselves, whether they want to do screening or testing? Yeah, that's a really, really good question. The, again, the vast majority of these genes, the cancer risks are not until adulthood. Okay. So we won't even consider doing a genetic test on somebody for the most part until they're at least 18. So they can consent to that themselves. Yes. Okay. At the same time, if I'm sitting with an 18 year old and let's say we know there's a BRCA mutation in the family. And so I'm going to test that person for it. I also am saying to this 18 year old, you know, if I test you now and I find this, the screening for this doesn't even begin until you're 25. Mm -hmm. So from now to 25, you can, you get to sit with the knowledge and do nothing about mm -hmm. it. That's not to say that person couldn't decide to make different lifestyle choices and things like that, right. but we're not going to screen that person until that time. Okay. So just because they can consent to it legally, does it still doesn't necessarily make it the best time to do that genetic testing. Mm -hmm. okay. There are of course, exceptions to that rule because there are some hereditary cancer syndromes that definitely affect children. Right. So if we find that in a family, then that's a completely different ball game. And then that's something where, at least in our clinics, we get uh, children's oncology involved in some mm -hmm. of those cases. Okay. Well, fabulous. Well, Deb, this is this has been great. I think very helpful. So I think the take home message for our audience is um, if you if it's been more than five years since you have been tested, regardless of your current health, um, well, unless you expect to die of some weird other heart disease or something in the next year, it's important to get re re retested or discuss retesting with, with your medical team. And if you've ever been tested and are a cancer survivor, again, you can, you, there could potentially be value um, in genetic testing for you, um, even if it's the first time. And again, to bring that up with your, um, with your medical team. Exactly. Get that right? Yeah, definitely. Okay, good. All right. Deb, thank you so much for your time and your expertise. Uh, and I uh, appreciate you being here. And bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye.